Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Zach Schalk. I'm the Indiana Program Director for Soul United Neighbors. Thank you so much for being here tonight to uh, join us to learn some about solar. Uh, we will get our Indiana Solar 101 presentation going shortly. Uh, I just want to leave a few minutes for, for folks to join. Uh, I see uh, a bunch of folks uh, coming in tonight and uh, seeing some familiar names. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, while we let people join, uh, if you can, please uh, feel free to, to uh, share your name and, and where you're joining us from in the chat. Um, if you send, uh, send the message to all panelists and attendees, that will let everybody uh, see who you are and, and where you're coming from. Um, so I'm just going to let things go for, for just another, another minute or two while, while folks continue to join. Uh, for those of you who are, are just joining us, my name is Zach Schalk. I'm the Indiana Program Director for Solar United Neighbors, and we'll get started uh, just here in a few minutes with our Indiana Solar 101 presentation. Uh, thank you to those of you who are uh, sharing, uh, sharing your names and where you're from in the chat. Hi, Nancy uh, from Indianapolis, Aaron from Fort Wayne, Aaron from Gary. Uh, welcome tonight, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right, well, uh, with that, I see that we're almost a couple minutes past the hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Uh, please feel free to continue uh, introducing yourself, sharing your, your name and, and where you're from in the chat. Uh, and just remember to send the message to all panelists and attendees. Okay, and so uh, before we get started, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Corey Ramsden, for a little bit of housekeeping. Corey? Hello, everybody. I'm Corey Ramsden. I'm our VP for Go Solar Programs, filling in tonight for um, Jessica, who is uh, Zach's supporter on my team, uh, and uh, very happy to be joining you this evening. Just want to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping details. You can see, um, if you've used Zoom before, and who hasn't these days, uh, you can, uh, as Zach mentioned, you can always submit questions in the chat box. We'll be monitoring that as well uh, through the evening and, and gathering those. We'll try to answer some along the way, but uh, we, if not, we will uh, certainly make sure that uh, we do when Zach pauses for questions. Um, and if uh, at the end, just to make sure everyone is aware, we're recording the session. So uh, we'll be um, posting this later on. So just keep that in mind. If you uh, don't wanna be on the recording, then obviously um, feel free to message us separately and uh, we'll answer those questions uh, on our own. If you wanna ask questions after the, the, the session, as well, we'll put this in the chat, but you're always welcome to email us at inteam at solelyunitedneighbors.org as well. Thanks very much. I'm Zach, take it away. All right. Thank you, Corey. And I do just want to send one more quick reminder. If you are asking questions, you're, you're obviously welcome to just email the, the panelists, but that means only Corey and myself will see it. Um, and we do have some experts on the line as well. Um, so please, if, if you are, um, and also it's good for everybody to see the questions that are that are being asked, it could spark a light bulb for other people. So if you can, please, uh, in the two line of the chat, select all panelists and attendees, and that'll make sure that everybody uh, will see the message. All right, so we can go ahead and get going. But before I get too far into the presentation, I did just want to take a moment um, to address racial justice and the inequities of our current energy system. Uh, so communities of color and particularly black communities bear an unfair share of the cost of energy production uh, and receive fewer benefits. Uh, families of color are disproportionately harmed by higher utility bills and shutoffs, and not to mention the negative environmental and health impacts of our legacy electricity generation infrastructure. So on top of that, housing discrimination is a barrier to homeownership and the solar ownership, which in Indiana requires homeownership. So when Sun started as a group of economically and racially diverse neighbors in Washington, D.C., they focused on solar because it helped people pay their electric bills. It also helped them stay in their homes at a time when D.C. was quickly gentrifying and the whole country was in the middle of a financial crisis. Rooftop Solar lets communities invest locally, creates good local jobs, and brings community control to the energy system within our reach. We're working towards a new energy system that everyone can participate in and one that's fair, just, and equitable. And we're really glad that you're here tonight to be a part of that solution. So Solar United Neighbors is a national 501c3 nonprofit organization. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, we started in 2007 and really got going uh, in 2008. 
Um, we are dedicated to helping Hoosiers go solar, join together, and fight for their energy rights. And while we are a national organization, we have on the ground programs in 12 states, including here in Indiana, where we launched in 2019. Um, and so tonight I'm going to be talking about our solar co-ops. Um, our co-ops are a model of bringing people together to help you leverage your bulk purchasing power with your neighbors uh, and get a good deal going solar. Um, so we are gonna be focusing specifically on the two co-ops that we have open right now for new members um, in, in and around the Indianapolis area and also in Northwest Indiana. Uh, that group is focusing on Lake, LaPorte, and Porter counties. Um, so, so we'll have direct links where you can uh, sign up to join those groups uh, here later in the evening. Oh, and it looks like Corey, Corey is sharing uh, those right now in the chat. Um, that's where our co-ops are open right now. We will be launching uh, additional co-ops in other parts of the state uh, later this year. So if, if uh, you aren't in any of these areas, uh, stay tuned. You'll, you'll be hearing more from us shortly. Um, I also wanted to make sure to take a moment to thank our uh, partners. Uh, we have fantastic community partners, uh, some that operate statewide and others that are just focused on specific areas uh, that are really uh, essential for us to be uh, successful in our efforts to connect with community members, help these co-ops grow, um, and help make sure we're putting as much solar as possible on rooftops around the state. So thank you so much to all our partners who really make this possible. So I always like to get this uh, presentation started by um, kind of doing a little bit of myth busting. Uh, one of the questions we commonly hear is, does solar really work in Indiana? Uh, we have uh, short days in the winter, we get a lot of snow. Do we have enough sunshine to make solar work? Um, and in short, the answer is yes. Well, we absolutely have enough solar resource uh, to, to make it, uh, have it make sense for you to go solar. Um, so what this, this map is showing uh, what's called uh, solar intensity or the available solar resource um, of the United States. It comes from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And what's really great about this map is it allows us to compare uh, the continental United States and, and uh, Indiana in particular uh, directly to Germany, which is in the, uh, the right off the East Coast um, inset there. And Germany has some of the highest solar penetration rates uh, in the world. And when you look, they have much less available solar resource according to this map than we do uh, than we have here in Indiana. Um, so, so the short answer is yes, we have plenty of sunshine here in Indiana. Uh, you know, we might as well harvest some of that sunshine uh, and let it pay your electric bills with solar. Um, and thousands of Hoosiers around the state are already recognizing uh, the fact that we, we have that solar resource and they're making the choice to invest in solar. Um, so this, this slide shows a few screenshots from a, a public map that's available uh, on sirensolar.org. Um, that just captures some of the growth in residential solar around the state, um, starting in, in 2011 when Indiana expanded net metering, and, and uh, that was right at the same time when solar panels were becoming more affordable, and so solar really started taking off, um, and right on through uh, 2019 when, when Solar United Neighbors um, launched. So more and more Hoosiers around the state are embracing solar, and I'm glad uh, that you're here tonight to learn about how you might be able to join them. So. The presentation uh, is going to be broken up into three parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about solar technology. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about how solar co-ops work and, and the benefits of the solar co-op model. And finally, we're going to talk about solar economics. Um, so at each uh, at the end of each section, I'll, I will pause and, and see if there, have ever, if there are any unanswered questions in the chat that I can cover. Uh, but please feel free to share any questions um, in the chat. Again, uh, sending them to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see your questions. Um, and we'll either have folks who will answer in the chat or I'll uh, get to the question at the end of each section. So let's talk about solar technology. So tonight we're going to be talking specifically about solar photovoltaic or PV technology. Uh, and that's the type of solar that converts solar energy into electricity. Um, it's really the, the main product that's on the market today. Um, and so over the next couple slides, we're going to break down the different components of your solar energy system. Uh, but, but this diagram kind of pulls them all together and hopefully helps you uh, visualize what it would look like. Um, each system will look a little different. Some might be mounted, some panels might be mounted on the ground. Um, others might be on different faces of your roof. 
uh, but all these components will exist in every solar installation. Um, so first you have the solar array, that's the, the panels on the roof, the, the part of the system that's going to capture that solar um, energy uh, and turn it into direct current or DC electricity. That DC electricity will then go to number two here on this, uh, on this chart, um, that is the solar inverter, and that's what takes the DC uh, direct current electricity and turns it into alternating current or AC electricity that you can actually use in your home. That AC electricity will then flow to your electrical panel where all your circuits come together in your home. And if you have uh, demand in your house, if you have uh, lights on or uh, you know, your uh, microwave running, um, those electrons will, will go into to serve that load. Um, but if you're actually producing more than, than you need at that time, those uh, ele unspent electrons will go out through your utility meter, number four here, and then it'll go out onto the grid where those electrons will go to your neighbors and your neighbors' neighbors until they're spent up. So let's dig a little bit deeper and, and unpack some of these different elements. Um, so first, the uh, solar panels that we're, we're going to be talking about um, are, th this drawing is to scale. So uh, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, each panel is going to be roughly uh, three feet wide or so and about five to six feet tall. Um, and, and so that's, if you have that image in your mind, they're about 40, 30 to 40 pounds. So pretty easy to, uh, for, for most folks to pick up. Um, and you're gonna hear me use some terminology uh, tonight. Um, and so I wanna make sure we clarify the difference between kilowatts or KWs and kilowatt hours. Um, so basically kilowatts are a thousand watts. And a watt is a measure of, um, of power. Um, so that's the amount of power that the panels are producing in any given instant. And then kilowatt hours are, again, a kilowatt is 1,000 watts. Um, and a kilowatt hour is a measure of energy. And so you pay for kilowatt hours um, each month in your electric bill. Um, but your system will be sized in kilowatts. Um, and so to figure out how your system is sized, you want to multiply the number of panels uh, in your system by the number of watts that those panels are rated to produce. So in this instance, we have 12 300 watt panels. So you multiply 300 times 12 and get a 3.6 kilowatt solar system. Um, and so most homeowners are going to install a system somewhere between two kilowatts, which is at the very, very smallest end of most residential installations and then to about 12 kilowatts, though we definitely do see some larger systems, especially if you live in a home with a lot of electricity usage or if you have multiple electric vehicles or, or something like that. Uh, but that's a, a, just a rough sense of, of range that, that you might uh, expect. So the panels themselves are um, you know, really designed around the solar cells. These are silicon wafers uh, that are, again, designed to absorb that uh, solar energy and, and turn it into uh, the uh, direct current electricity that, that is what powers the system. And then the rest of the, the panel is just really designed to protect uh, those solar cells. So you got uh, tempered glass and capsule in and metal frame. They're really sturdy, designed to be outside and, and handle the elements. And when you string together those panels, uh, you get an array. So an array is just a bunch of panels strung together into a single um, system. Um, so again, the, the next component, so after the panels produce that direct current electricity, it sends the electricity to the inverter. And this is where uh, the direct current electricity becomes the alternating current electricity that we actually use in our home. Uh, and so there are a couple different kinds of, of inverters that are available. And before I go in too deep, uh, it's important to note that you don't have to have a preference of the different type of inverters. One of the um, the benefits of working uh, with the co-op is that you'll know exactly what options are available from the installer um, as a co-op member, and the installer will produce a custom system for you based on your individual needs, and they should be able to recommend the right um, inverter option that, that fits uh, what you need. Um, but for those of you who are interested in, in some of the more technical details, um, the, the main three types of options that are, are on the market are represented here on this page. So we have the string inverter first, was kind of the original solution uh, on the inverter market. And it basically, just as its name describes, it strings all the panels together, does the inversion at a single place. Um, and it's, it's really good for uh, simple systems. Uh, and 
and is uh, relatively cheaper because, because it's a little older, a little more established technology and a little simpler. Um, however, if your system is a little more complicated or if parts of your system might be shaded differently at different parts of the day, um, you might want something like a microinverter, uh, which basically was developed to handle those more complicated systems um, and essentially has the inversion process happen at the panel level. So you have a little microinverter underneath each panel that optimizes the system uh, based on the production of that individual panel. However, these uh, do tend to be a little more expensive. They also introduce more components that might break. And so it's not necessarily the best option for everybody. And so in the middle here, we have the string inverter with DC optimizers, which kind of provides the best of both worlds, uh, where you have an inverter that, uh, that handles the actual inversion process, but then DC optimizers at the panel level that allows your system uh, to be optimized for different panel outputs uh, at different times of day. Um, so again, these are the, the three options here. The string inverter is this kind of simplest, lowest cost option. The micro inverter is a little more complicated, a little higher cost, but potentially higher efficiency. And then the string inverter and DC optimizer that kind of is the best of both worlds uh, and brings, brings the things together. Uh, so next we have the electrical panel. Uh, again, this is where all of the circuits in your home come together. Um, and and for, for most folks, the, your solar installation will just plug right in to the electrical panel uh, and no muss or fuss uh, other than that. Um, so it's a fairly simple connection for, for most people. Um, however, in some homes, especially older homes or uh, homes that for whatever reason have a, a full uh, electrical box, uh, you might need a, a panel or a, a more complicated uh, electrical system upgrade. Um, and that is something, again, that is a benefit of working with the co-op um, when the installer comes out uh, to take a look at your, at your home as part of the co-op process bef before they produce uh, your, your custom uh, system design and quote for solar, they'll take a look and we'll, we'll let you know if you're going to need any kind of upgrade. Um, and as a co-op member, you'll have already received information about what, if, if you do need a, a panel upgrade or a broader electrical system upgrade, exactly what that, that should cost. Um, so there shouldn't be any surprises, uh, you know, at the 11th hour, um, you should know what to expect up front and the installer will communicate uh, everything clearly to you. But again, for, for most folks, uh, there isn't a, a system upgrade required. So the panels will obviously, uh, if you're doing a, a roof mounted system, will need to uh, connect to your home. So that's where the racking comes in. Uh, here we have a picture of some installers and a traditional uh, asphalt pitched uh, or pitched asphalt shingle roof. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways to connect panels to your roof. Um, and the, the main takeaway here is that uh, no matter what type of roof you have, there's a solution for you. Um, for most folks who do have those, those pitched asphalt shingle roofs, um, there's a fairly simple uh, flashing solution uh, to, to make sure that uh, any kind of penetrations into your roof are covered by, by the flashing and other encapsulants underneath um, so that you don't have leaks. Uh, but even if you have a, a, a roof that can't be penetrated or, or if you have a standing sea metal roof, um, there's, there's a solution for you. Um, so for instance, here's a standing sea metal roof, which can actually be a, a fairly easy installation because they can just clip directly on to uh, the standing seams if, if that's available for you. Um, and we do also work with uh, ground mounted systems through the co-op. So if you happen to have space uh, that might be better for solar for, for whatever reason, uh, you can absolutely uh, do a ground, a ground mounted system. Um, sometimes depending on, on the installer, it, it might cost a little bit more uh, for ground mounted systems just because of uh, the trenching, the bearing of the electrical lines as the, the power has to get back to your, um, to your home. Um, but sometimes it, it can be cheaper if that's an option. Uh, we do tend to encourage folks to explore their, their roof first because you aren't using your roof for anything else, but you might want to use your yard. So, uh, but that is something to consider uh, if that's an option available to you. Um, when, if you are going to join the co-op, uh, we do have a process where we uh, will review where, where, you're, uh, where you're planning on installing the solar. And so if you think your roof isn't good for solar, but you're planning to do a ground mounted uh, installation, when you, when you join the co-op on the form, you can actually drop a pin on a map to tell us where, 
uh, you think you're going to have your solar panels installed. So we make sure we're looking at the right part of your property um, to make sure it's a good fit for solar. Um, so speaking of what makes a good fit for solar, uh, there are a couple of different variables that you'll want to keep uh, in mind. Um, so first is the orientation. So uh, this, this applies to a ground mounted system or a roof, uh, a roof mounted system, but basically the ideal orientation is, is south, uh, potentially southwest, depending on where exactly you are. Um, but basically panels are efficient enough today that east or west facing uh, systems can, can still produce enough to be economically viable. You really just don't wanna be facing north. Um, that's when the panels won't capture enough sunlight um, over the course of the year to really make sense. Um, and you also want to make sure to avoid as much shading as possible. Um, anytime your panels are shaded, they aren't, they aren't producing uh, electricity. So uh, avoiding as much shading as possible, and in particular, avoiding shading between kind of your peak production windows of, you know, between 9 and 10 in the morning uh, to 2 to 3 in the afternoon um, is, is really critical. Um, you also want to make sure you have enough space to mount the panels. Uh, whether that's on your roof or or in uh, on your property somewhere else if you're looking for a ground mount. Um, so for that two kilowatt system size that we think is really kind of the smallest uh, residential system size, you, you'd want around 200 square feet of, of space for that installation. And so you can kind of scale that up when you're adding more panels and increasing your system size, just to give you a sense of how much space um, you might need. Uh, and again, th these are all the factors that we will take into consideration when we review your property uh, uh, to make sure you're a good fit for solar before adding you to the co-op after you fill out the, the co-op sign-up form. Um, and then finally, you wanna consider your roof condition. Um, obviously, this picture is an example of a roof in poor condition. Um, so, uh, so basically, our rule of thumb is that if you are going to need to replace your roof sometime in the next 10 years, we would encourage you to do that either before installing solar or at the same time as your panels are going in. And that's just because it's really expensive to take the panels down, repair your roof, and then put the panels back up. Um, so it oftentimes it makes a lot of sense to repair your roof um, at the, the same time or before you put panels up just to uh, help the economics make out uh, down the road. Okay, and the last thing that I wanna mention here briefly, uh, actually it wasn't on the diagram, but, but that's batteries. Um, so we often get, get uh, folks asking questions about what happens when, when the power goes out. Um, will I still be able to use my solar panels uh, if the grid is down for whatever reason? And so for, for most folks uh, who have grid tied systems, um, when the grid goes down, your solar panels are also going to shut down or more accurately, your inverter will, will switch off uh, so that your panels stop, stop producing electricity. And that is really a safety mechanism uh, that is designed to make sure that if the grid is out, you know, there's a power line down somewhere and there might be folks, uh, light workers out there trying to fix the problem. We don't want to be sending any electricity out onto the grid um, that might get somebody hurt. Um, so there are uh, special inverters that are available that will actually allow your system to island uh, as if you had a generator that was kicking on on site for, for backup power. Um, but that would, and, and that is something that, that you can talk to your installer about, uh, but that would only mean that you would be able to use your electricity that your panels are, are producing um, without any kind of storage. So during the day, if the power is out, you'd still be able to uh, produce electricity. But at night or, you know, uh, for whatever reason, if your panels weren't uh, getting enough sunshine, you, you wouldn't be able to use any uh, electricity. And so that's where batteries come in if you uh, really want to make sure uh, that you have power during an outage. Um, and so batteries are really great if you are focused on uh, having backup power for uh, if, because you live in somewhere that has frequent utility outages or you have critical loads at home like, like medical equipment um, or uh, something else that, that you want to make sure never uh, uh, loses power. Or if you're really focused on emergency or disaster preparedness, um, resilience is, is always something that um, is, is on folks' mind, especially with you know, recent events in, in Texas or, or in California uh, uh, last summer. Um, so more and more, we are finding that folks are interested in batteries. Unfortunately, batteries are still fairly expensive uh, and we don't really have the, um, we don't really have a good 
uh, mechanism here in Indiana, at most utilities at least, uh, to, to make it economical uh, for you to install batteries and really uh, help to provide services to the grid. Um, so right now, batteries are good for resilience. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, batteries are good for, yeah, for backup, backup power, uh, but not so good for helping you save money. Um, so, but if you would like to learn more about batteries, you can go to uh, soyunitedneighbors.org slash storage and uh, download our, our free guide. And there's also a whole hour long webinar just about battery storage uh, that you can find uh, a recording of at that website. Um, but you can also, uh, you know, make sure to let your installer know that you're interested in batteries. And even if you aren't able to go uh, to install battery storage today, you can uh, let them know about your interest in the future and they can make sure uh, to design your system in a way that it'll be uh, 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 compatible with a future uh, uh, battery installation. Okay, so, so that uh, kind of wraps up uh, this run through of the different components of your uh, solar energy system. Uh, but just as a refresher, we talked about the solar panels uh, that are absorbing the solar uh, energy, turning into direct current electricity, that DC electricity then goes to the inverter where it becomes AC or alternating current electricity, uh, which then goes to your electrical panel where it'll either uh, you know, flow to appliances in your home or uh, flow out to the utility meter uh, and then out through the meter onto the electric grid where it'll go to your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbors before it's all spin up. Um, so that brings us to the next point here, which is uh, net metering. Uh, what happens to that electricity that you send back to the grid? And do you get to benefit from it? So net metering is essentially uh, what allows for the flow of electricity to and from customers. And so right now in Indiana, you get a, a credit, a kilowatt hour credit uh, that is you know, equal to a kilowatt hour that you purchase from the electric grid. So it's a one-to-one -one swap. Uh, and for every, at the end of the month, you'll look at your electricity that you used minus the electricity that you produced. And uh, whatever is left over is your monthly uh, electric bill, at least the volumetric side of your electric bill. Uh, of your electric bill. So that means if you produce more than you use in a given month, you actually end up with credits. And I think uh, visually is kind of a, a good way to express this. And, and this, uh, this slide helps you see the solar offset that net metering creates. Excuse me. Um, so what we're looking at here on the left is uh, a daily solar production from kind of a, uh, an average residential solar customer. And on the right, we're seeing monthly solar production over the course of the year. Um, and so the, the orange in both different charts is your solar production. So obviously it follows the sun. That means production is maximized during the middle of the day when the sun is out. And then over the course of the year, when the days are longer and sunnier in the, in the summer months, you're, you're maximizing your production. And so this, is, this assumes a system that's designed to cover 100% of the uh, owner's annual electric costs. And so basically what happens is that over those summer months where you're actually producing more than you use, you're building up credits. And here in Indiana, those credits roll over um, throughout, uh, or roll over without end. So you get to continue to benefit from those credits until you spin them up. And so basically you'll produce more credits than you use in the summer, and then you can spin them down in the, the winter months, the shoulder parts of the, the graph here, when you aren't producing as much as, as you're using. Um, so that just gives you a, a sense of how net metering helps you uh, create a solar offset and benefit from, uh, from the electricity you're producing uh, over the course of the year, even if you're producing more in some months than you're actually using. And so this is how most folks are able to kind of use the electric grid as a battery themselves uh, and still benefit from all the solar energy that they're producing. Um, so here in Indiana, we do have a little bit of uh, a complication with net metering that comes from um, some uh, unfortunate solar policies that were passed at the state level in 2017. Um, so in Indiana's investor-owned utilities, so that's uh, IPL, or I guess now AES Indiana, uh, Duke Energy, NIPSCO, INM, and Vectron, or Centerpoint down in Southwest Indiana, 
Um, net metering uh, will be offered uh, for systems who that are installed uh, by July 1, 2022 in most utilities, and they'll receive net metering until uh, 2032, so for at least 10 years. Um, net metering might end sooner in at least veterans territory. Uh, they, have, uh, they have filed to end uh, their net metering for new solar customers sooner, uh, but most of the other uh, utilities, we are expecting them to offer net metering until uh, July 1, 2022 for residential customers. Um, so systems installed after that deadline will not receive net metering. So after net metering goes away, instead of getting that full one-to-one uh, -one net metering retail credit, um, homeowners will be credited at a lower price, um, typically around a third of the cost of the retail rate uh, plus 25%. Uh, but as I mentioned, that rate is still in the process of being set at each of the different utilities. Um, so we will see over the course of the coming months uh, what ends up, uh, what the uh, post net metering excess distributed generation rate, as it's called, ends up, ends up looking like. And just to be clear, that rate will only be applied for any of the excess generation or uh, depending on the, the netting interval, um, what you use above and beyond uh, over the, the given course of time, like over uh, above and beyond what you use in a, in a particular month. Uh, for instance, um, if it's below, you know, the usage of the of the month, you're still self-consuming that uh, on the bill. Um, so we'll look more at this uh, shortly when we get to our uh, uh, our economic projection chart. Um, so you can see exactly how that will impact uh, over the lifetime of a solar installation that was uh, completed this year. Um, so the last thing I'll say on this slide is that uh, the reason net metering is scheduled to start going away in 2022 is because of SEA 309, a uh, law that was passed in 2017. And that law was pushed at the State House by um, Indiana's electric utilities. And uh, they were able to successfully uh, push for this bill uh, because they had more power than solar advocates had in 2017. Um, and, and so this is just my call for uh, folks like you who are on the line who care about solar, uh, who want to see pro-solar policies in the state, um, to please join, join the solar movement and help us advocate uh, for strong solar policies like extending net metering and making sure that more Hoosiers uh, can benefit from this foundational um, economic uh, uh, component to investing in rooftop solar. Uh, I have a link that you can uh, that you can use, uh, you'll see later in this presentation, to contact your elected officials and, and uh, ask for them to uh, support pro-solar policies. You can just go to solarunitedneighbors.org slash insolarfuture um, to find that email action. All right, so uh, that comes to the end of, of this part of the presentation. I do just want to kind of tick through some of the frequently asked questions that we get and then um, we'll go and see if there are any uh, questions in the chat that haven't been answered yet. Um, so first of all, uh, how long do systems last? Um, so the kind of industry standard is to say that uh, your solar panels will uh, continue producing electricity for at least 25 years. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the, standard, uh, the, the standard system life. Um, and that is tied up to this next question of, of warranties. So there are three main type of warranties uh, for you to consider. Um, so the first is the production warranty. And again, that is uh, basically uh, a warranty that guarantees uh, a certain amount of energy production uh, over the lifetime of, of the panels. Uh, most uh, panels are, are, have a 25 year warranty and, and will generally, uh, the warranty will uh, guarantee somewhere between 80 to 90% of the day one capacity, the day, day one nameplate capacity production in the 25th year. Um, the other, uh, another type of warranty is the equipment warranty. Um, so this is again from the manufacturer of, of the, the equipment or the, the panels or the inverter. Um, we see equipment warranties that vary depending on, on the manufacturer, um, but typically uh, they're anywhere from 10 years to that 25-year uh, uh, lifetime of the system, and it'll cover, uh, if the equipment breaks, uh, a replacement of uh, the, the broken component. Um, and then finally is the labor warranty. And so the labor warranty is an agreement between you and the installer. 
and, and it will cover uh, you know, their part of the job. Uh, there's a wide range of labor warranties and, and what they cover. Uh, we've seen labor warranties that last one year. We've seen labor warranties that last uh, the lifetime of, of the work. Um, and oftentimes it'll cover things like roof penetrations and uh, other uh, you know, electrical work, other types of, of components uh, that are under the control of um, the installer. Um, but again, it'll vary uh, widely depending on uh, depending on your, your installer. So this is another uh, area that's a, a benefit of being part of the co-op. Uh, that's because when you, when you join the co-op and the installer is selected, you will receive a package that, that in, in plain language spells out um, you know, the equipment that the installer is, is planning to use, uh, the warranties the installer is planning to offer. Uh, and so you'll have that right at the uh, tips of your fingers so you know exactly what to expect. Uh, so another question we hear frequently is about maintenance. Uh, so maintenance is one of the key selling points of a rooftop solar system. That's because it's a very low maintenance system. Um, so especially uh, a system that's installed on a pitched uh, asphalt shingle roof, uh, it tends to clean itself pretty nicely when it rains. Uh, you know, snow uh, tends to melt right off um, and there's no moving parts. Uh, so there's, there's very, there's not as much uh, that can break. Uh, as other kinds of uh, complicated systems. Um, so we do recommend that you know, every five years or so, you, you have somebody uh, you know, take a look at your system, uh, give it a clean. Uh, that's oftentimes something that your installer can, can help you out with, and we can answer questions about that as well. Um, but, but again, it's a low maintenance system. It shouldn't, uh, hopefully shouldn't give you uh, any problems. Um, next, we have uh, property value and taxes. Um, so uh, I'll start with taxes. That is uh, one of the, the benefits uh, here in Indiana is that we actually have a renewable energy property tax uh, uh, exemption. So, so even if your property uh, you know, value does increase, uh, you can exempt any, any added value from your renewable energy investment, the solar panels in this case. So there's a simple, a simple form that you can file to make sure uh, your tax bill does not go up. Uh, uh, because of solar panels. Um, and so that does lead to the property value part of the equation, um, which is that there is a great uh, and growing evidence from all over the country that investing in solar panels uh, will increase your property value. Um, and that will, uh, you know, our, uh, the, the evidence seems to indicate that that value is only going to continue to go up as more home buyers are interested in purchasing a home that already has solar panels installed. Um, so, so that's a, a great benefit of, uh, of uh, installing rooftop solar. Uh, that does lead into the next one, is, which is homeowner's insurance. Um, so it's definitely important to tell your homeowner's insurance that you're installing solar panels um, uh, so that your, uh, the value of your panels is covered in case there, there is uh, damage. Uh, but I know for, for most uh, solar owners, there uh, is, is no change in their, in their actual plan or their their payments, um, or if there is, it's, it's very uh, small. Um, I've only heard maybe one uh, uh, person who actually had to change their homeowner's insurance after they installed solar panels, but I think that's very rare. Um, so I know we have several uh, solar owners uh, on the line, so please feel free to, to share your experience with uh, your homeowner's insurance um, in the chat. Uh, next up, we have weather damage or snow cover. Um, so snow cover is definitely something that uh, is hard to avoid here in Indiana. I know just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were a lot of solar panels around the state that were covered in uh, a foot or so of snow. Um, so, but again, the nice thing about the panels is, especially if it's, you know, at, if they're on a pitched roof, they, they will tend to clean themselves off when the, when the snow melts um, and, and it should melt fairly quickly. Um, weather damage, you know, the, again, these panels are designed to be outside and handle the elements uh, and, uh, so I know, again, this might be a good opportunity for uh, solar owners who are on the line to um, share any experience you've had with, with hail or, or other weather damage. Uh, but the reality is that these panels are, are designed to be outside. Um, they should be able to handle uh, what Mother Nature can throw at them here in Indiana. Um, next up, we have, uh, will HOAs allow solar on, on my home? Uh, so I don't know if, if folks might have seen the Indianapolis Star uh, article that was published on this topic uh, just earlier this week. 
Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, so each, there is no uh, statewide requirement for HOAs to allow rooftop solar uh, as there is in other states. Um, so you're just gonna have to read your uh, governing uh, documents of your HOA uh, and determine uh, what the rules are. Um, this is something that, that we are happy to help you with. Um, and so if you have any questions or concerns about your HOA, uh, please feel free to reach out um, and, and we're happy to, to talk through your options and potentially um, help you uh, communicate with your HOA board and try to, if there, if there are HOA restrictions, try to help you get that changed. Because uh, there definitely are HOAs around the state that do allow solar um, and we hope to see that, that trend continue. Um, though I will say one more, one more pitch to uh, join the solar movement and help us advocate for real HOA solar access uh, policies uh, here in Indiana to make sure that uh, homeowners associations can't put up a barrier or unreasonably restrict um, folks who wanna install solar in their own home. Um, and then finally, for historic districts, uh, most historic districts really just don't wanna see panels facing the street, uh, but it'll have to be a case-by-case -case basis um, so you'll, you'll uh, need to go before your historic district and follow whatever their um, guidelines are for getting a solar, uh, solar panels approved. Uh, again, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out and we can help you. And oftentimes installers uh, will help with both uh, HOA and the historic district uh, um, uh, approval process, you know, especially by doing things like, like providing the, the drawings and, and designs and stuff that you might need for approval. Um, okay, so that's the end of the first part of our presentation. I know I've seen a lot of activity in the chat. I'm sorry, uh, I haven't been able to keep up. Uh, but Corey, is, are there any questions that uh, haven't been addressed in, in the chat yet? It looks like most of them were addressed. Um, thanks to our participants for uh, responding back and forth as well. I only see one here that uh, maybe you could answer, which is um, Valerie's asking how much productivity is lost on cloudy days, uh, which we have a lot of here in Indiana. That, that's a good question, uh, and you know there there are a lot of variables there. So um, it, you know it depends on exactly what the cloud cover looks like and where your panels are situated. So it's hard to answer in the in the abstract, um, but you should be able to get a, a good sense of of you know based on where where we're located, um, you know what we what Indiana uh, how much solar energy you know, your location will will get on average over the course of the year. Um, so you can, you know, estimate that over the course of the year without worrying about individual cloudy days. Um, so it's hard to answer that in the abstract, but if, you know, whenever you get a, a system design, you can ask, ask your installer about your specific system and, and see what they say. <laughs> All right, great. Well, I will go ahead and keep us rolling. So uh, next up, we're going to talk about how the solar co-ops work. Um, so solar co-ops, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are really an opportunity for you to join together with your neighbors uh, and leverage the bulk purchasing power of the group to get a great value on a solar installation. Um, in addition to the value of uh, you know, working with the group, you, you get support and, and, and uh, help through the whole process, both from Solar United neighbors uh, and in our kind of capacity as consumer advocates and providing technical support, but also from other group members. So you know you're not just kind of out there um, in the wilderness of the solar market by yourself. Um, and as, I, as I've mentioned several times, I hope that through being part of the co-op, uh, you will become part of Indiana's growing solar movement, uh, fighting not just for uh, you know, your ability to install solar on your own home, but also the ability of Hoosiers around the state to benefit from rooftop solar. Um, so one of the, the great uh, aspects of our solar co-op is who actually selects the installer. Um, and I'll talk more on the next slide about the different stages of the co-op process, but I just wanted to highlight up front that the co-op members themselves are who actually selects the installer. Um, so as a, as a co-op member, you will have uh, the ability um, to, to join the selection committee group uh, and compare the different competitive uh, proposals from, from installers interested in working with the group on things like price, equipment quality, warranties, uh, their company's experience, and uh, their business location. So the co-op process uh, kind of has a couple different stages that we like to highlight. Um, and actually, the co-ops that are open right now in Northwest Indiana and in Indianapolis are at two different uh, parts of the process. 
Um, so Indianapolis, which just recently launched uh, earlier this year, is still in the first stage where we're trying to grow the group. Um, so uh, we host events like this, uh, we help folks uh, learn about solar, and we hope as many people as possible sign up uh, on the co-op website, uh, which Corey, Corey shared earlier and we'll, uh, we'll share again later in the presentation. Um, so this early stage is really all about the growth uh, of the co-op. And we really do rely on co-op members, volunteers, um, other solar supporters to help us spread the word. Um, so please, if, if you know other folks who might be interested in solar, uh, please let them know about the co-op in your area. Um, so, but once the group gets large enough to hold what we call a selection committee, um, that's typically around 30 participants, um, we, will, uh, we will get that group together from volunteers in, in the co-op itself and actually host a meeting where we will compare the different competitive offerings that come from installers who want to work with the group um, and compare them side by side so that the co-op members themselves can actually look at the options and select one single installer to serve the whole group. So that's really where the bulk purchasing power of the group comes to play because installers are willing to give really competitive offers to a large group of educated and motivated potential customers um, that allows them to kind of cut into some of their traditional costs um, and re reduce the cost of bringing new members in, or bringing new uh, customers into their, their business. Um, and so once the installer is selected, which the installer is already selected uh, for the Northwest Indiana um, group, um, it's really a, a sprint to the sign up deadline. Um, and so we do continue to help the groups grow. We continue to host these uh, solar information um, sessions. But once uh, an installer is selected, each co-op member will be connected with that installer. Uh, they will schedule a site visit where the installer will actually look at your property, talk to you about your individual needs and interests um, so that they can produce a custom uh, proposal that, that fits your needs. Um, and so, so you'll get that free uh, custom proposal for rooftop solar at the group rate. And that's when you can then decide as a co-op member whether or not solar is right for you. Um, and so if you do sign a contract, which we obviously hope that you do, um, then you'll schedule the installation with the installer. Uh, and then at the end, we, you know, because we're trying to bring people together, we want to build this strong solar movement, uh, we will celebrate with a party. Uh, parties have not been nearly as fun uh, over the past year, uh, but we are really looking forward to the day when we can get back together um, in person and, and celebrate uh, solar in a community near you soon. All right, so I didn't see as many uh, questions come through about uh, the so, uh, during the solar co-op portion, although I do, I think I see one panel, or I'm sorry, one question. Uh, uh, oh, and it looks like Corey has actually answered that. Thank you, Corey. All right, so let's keep things moving and talk about solar economics. Um, so basically, uh, before we dive too deep into the specific costs of installing panels on your home, um, I think it's important to take a step back and think about things in context of your monthly electric bills. Um, basically, as this chart shows, over the past 10 years, the average electric rates at Indiana's five investor and utilities have increased by 40%. Um, and those electric bills continue to go up, up, and up. And so it is true that uh, rooftop solar does is a, a substantial investment still to this day, uh, but it's not an investment that you're making in a vacuum. Instead, you should think about it as an investment that you're making in the context of these ever-increasing electric bills. And so rooftop solar allows you to take you know, your electric bills over the lifetime of your system, <clears throat> excuse me, bundle them together in an upfront investment that will actually generate a return over the lifetime of the panels. And so we are able to uh, quantify some of the savings that come through the co-op as solar has become increasingly affordable. Um, so this chart here shows uh, uh, average uh, national cost in installing solar based on real, um, uh, real industry data in blue. And then in, in orange, you can see the actual average cost uh, from our national solar co-ops, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that we've tracked since 2014. And so what you can see here is that the cost of solar has continued to go down uh, as the panels and equipment become more affordable. And the solar co-ops have consistently come in uh, well below the national average cost 
Um, and again, that's the bulk purchasing power of the group at play. Uh, and so if you're curious about where those savings might be coming from, um, again, this, this is kind of another way to, to look at uh, the information on the last slide. So when we're looking at uh, where the costs of uh, rooftop solar uh, actually break down, um, we see that the system components are becoming an increasingly smaller part of the, the pie. That's, um, that's as the cost of panels and inverters and racking continues to go down as the, uh, as the industry gets more efficient. And labor costs are actually going down too. Um, but the soft cost uh, has, you know, is now almost 60% of the, the average cost of installing residential solar. And soft costs include things like, like permitting um, and, and engineering reviews, but also things like uh, marketing and customer acquisition. And so that's directly the part of the cost of going solar that the co-op model is designed um, to, to cut into because we're bringing together a large group of educated and motivated um, potential customers right to the selected installer. Okay, so here's the, the part that I know a lot of folks are waiting for. This is where we can actually take a look at some example pricing. Um, so but before I, I get into the specific numbers here, um, I do just want to give a caveat that every in individual solar installation is going to look different. Um, it's going to have different production depending on where your panels uh, are actually located. Uh, your energy usage is going to look different, which is going to play an even larger role in in what your return on investment will look like uh, if and when net metering does go away um, uh, at the at uh, 2032, uh, because that changes uh, the value of the production depending on if it uh, exceeds your usage over whatever the netting interval is. Um, so, so this chart isn't meant to be, uh, you know, exactly what you should expect from your your solar proposal. Instead, it's meant to be kind of illustrative of. Uh, where the value of your solar installation is coming from and what, what you should uh, expect uh, to, to see in, in your you know, savings on average. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this, what, what we're looking at here is an estimate uh, uh, based on two different system sizes. So uh, a four kilowatt system size on the left and an eight kilowatt system size on the right. Um, and, and so that kind of gives you a sense of the range of the, the smaller residential size, which is four kilowatts to eight kilowatts, which is a little bit above average, um, and, and, but, but a, good, a good sense of scale uh, that we often see in our co-op. Um, so again, you multiply the system size by the price per watt to get your, your uh, top line price. So you take the four, four kilowatt system size uh, by our average $2.56 per watt um, estimated uh, solar price. So you multiply that $2.56 by 4,000 or by 8,000, and that's how we get the top line price of a little over $10,000 or about $20,500. Um, then we, uh, the 26% federal investment tax credit was extended at the end of last year. Um, so if you have the, the tax appetite, you can take that, uh, that credit right off the top. And that gets you to um, a total of, uh, of just under uh, $9,000 for, um, I'm sorry, just, just under uh, $8,000 for the four kilowatt system and just over $15,000 for the eight kilowatt system. Um, but then that's when you start seeing your electricity savings. And so uh, you're in this estimate, which we, uh, which we compiled an estimated electricity savings of about a little over $600 or $1,200 per year, and then that accumulates over the lifetime of the system. Um, and so we've, we've broken it out here to uh, before net metering ends, and then our, our best guess of what things will look like after net metering ends to get a net profit at the end of the day of uh, just over $6,600 for the four kilowatt system or just over $14,000 for the eight kilowatt system. Um, so again, this is gonna look different depending on on your uh, specific uh, panels, your, your uh, specific system, also your utility and the electric rates at your utility. Um, so this is just meant to kind of show you where the value of your solar uh, system will come from and how you should see a return on that investment over the lifetime of the system. And I should say the average payback period that we see here in Indiana is usually between 10 and 12 years, depending on your utility. So everything after that tends to be uh, a net profit for, for folks. 
Um, so through both of these co-ops, we are also offering uh, electric vehicle charging. So that can either be in addition to a solar installation, or if you uh, decide that you're not ready to go solar, you can, but you are interested in electric vehicle charging, you can install a level two electric vehicle charger, um, excuse me, at your home or business through the co-op. And that'll just allow you to charge, uh, charge an electric vehicle faster than just plugging into a normal wall outlet. So there's a wide range of equipment offerings and price offerings uh, available on the market. So it's hard to kind of give as clear a sense as solar here, uh, but we do estimate a total cost uh, through the co-op of somewhere between a thousand and just under $3,000. Um, and it definitely, where you can see the best uh, cost savings is to pair uh, solar panels uh, with your level two EV charger uh, together as a lot of folks are increasingly doing. Um, so I do just want to uh, note, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, make one last note about the federal investment tax credit. I, I mentioned earlier uh, that it was extended at the end of last year. So uh, for systems installed in 2021 and 2022, um, you can take the 26% tax credit uh, before it steps down to 22% in 2023 and then disappears entirely for residential installations uh, under current law in 2024. Um, so this is just will provide some some pretty good certainty for folks um, that that you can definitely take this tax credit um, uh, if you install your system this year. Um, and even if you don't have the tax appetite for the full tax credit um, in your 2021 taxes, um, you can actually extend that out over up to uh, five years. Um, so we are not tax experts. We definitely uh, are tax professionals. We, we encourage you to talk to your tax professional about what makes the most sense for you. Uh, but, but there's more information about um, uh, this, the, the investment tax credit, <clears throat> excuse me, and other, uh, other incentives on our Solar United members website. Um, okay, so last in this section, I did just want to highlight some uh, financing options uh, that, that might be available. Um, and so uh, financing options uh, are often offered by installers. Um, and so you can definitely, if you are interested in financing, uh, you can let the installer know and, and they might be able to provide uh, financing for you. Uh, but we definitely encourage you to look at other options um, as well. Oftentimes uh, the financing terms available through installers who typically aren't originating loans themselves aren't as favorable as what might be available elsewhere in the market. Um, and so uh, there are all kinds of different options available, uh, but will probably be dependent on your uh, specific situation. Um, so you can look at home equity line of credits or standard loans uh, that might be available to you depending on, on your uh, financial situation. There are also other solo, special solo loans or, or bridge loans, oftentimes that can help you, uh, you know, get to the point where you can actually monetize the, the solar tax credit. Um, you can also uh, refinance your, your mortgage if that's something you're interested in and include the solar, uh, the solar system as part of that refinancing package. There are uh, various uh, FHA programs uh, that can allow you to do that uh, and, and get benefit from the fantastic uh, low, uh, uh, low interest rates that are available from FHA uh, mortgages right now. Um, and then there are also uh, a couple of options uh, for credit unions that, that you can, uh, that are national in scope uh, that offer uh, uh, special uh, financing options for uh, for solar uh, that you would be uh, eligible um, to, to inquire about as a Solar United Neighbors co-op member. Um, so that's the Clean Energy Credit Union or the Community First Credit Union, there are two options. Um, there is also grant funding available for anybody who might live in a, a rural community and, and is looking to install solar uh, to offset their energy load on a rural business like a, a farm or really any other uh, business in a rural area uh, through the USDA. Uh, that's the Rural Energy for America or a program or REAP program. Um, and if that's something you're interested in, uh, we do offer uh, services to help, help folks uh, fill out the uh, fairly substantial paperwork uh, to, to apply for that, that grant funding. Um, so as I, I think I saw Corey shared in the chat, uh, we do have a, a webpage, solarunitedneighbors.org slash financing, uh, where you can learn more about all of these different options. Okay, and so before I go on to uh, what's next, I think I see a question from Nancy about the difference between uh, level two and level one vehicle chargers. Um, so, so Nancy, a level one charger is really just uh, plugging it into a regular wall outlet. 
Um, and it often takes a really long time to charge uh, that way. And so basically going from level one to level two um, allows you to charge faster, exactly how much faster and, and you know, how quickly you can uh, charge your vehicle with a, a level one or a level two charger really depends on the vehicle and the for a level two charger, the specific charger that, that you have. Uh, but basically it, it allows you to, um, in a lot of cases, double or, or more the, uh, the amount of charging you're able to do over a given course of time. And then obviously the level three is like the fast charging um, for uh, you know, commercial grade fast charging that you'll see at places like Walmart or, um, or other charging locations um, around the country. Um, Corey, are there any other questions that, uh, that I didn't get to yet? Uh, yeah, a couple uh, more here. We have one question from uh, Laura asking about, uh, what about solar for church buildings? Well, that's a great question. So uh, we have had multiple churches that have joined our co-ops and uh, you know, churches and other nonprofits are certainly uh, able to join the group and get a free custom quote for, for solar at, at the group rate. Um, it can be a little more complicated for churches for, for different reasons. Uh, you know, the decision-making process uh, is definitely different for a household uh, than uh, a church. Um, also, the uh, tax credit is, is something that churches aren't able to, uh, to benefit from, uh, at least you know, without fairly complicated paperwork. Um, uh, and, and so that, that can be, the, the cost can be a burden. Um, but actually, I was just on a call earlier today with, with a group that is planning on uh, doing a webinar just for churches who are interested in going solar uh, later, uh, later in April. Um, so if, if you are at a congregation that you think is interested in going solar, I would definitely encourage them to sign up uh, for, for the co-op um, and, uh, and get, a, get a quote through the group and, and stay tuned for uh, more information uh, specific to uh, churches who are looking to go solar. Another question here, uh, are there any discounts for senior citizens for solar? Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with any right now that are available here in Indiana. Um, I don't know, Corey, are there any national ones that we should let people know about? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would love to see a program like that. And maybe that's something we can, we can try to advocate for here. Here in Indiana. Let's see, just looking through the rest of the chat here, see if we've got any other questions. Um, we have one from Patricia here about, um, and I pay, this is uh, if a natural gas generator pops or turns on automatically when one's power is out, why is that electricity not a danger to electric workers fixing wires? So in other words, why, why can you do this with a generator and not with solar? Yeah, so I, that, that's a, a great question. And basically, it, uh, you can do that with solar, but it requires a special inverter that's designed to handle the system the same way that a generator is handled. So, so that basically allows you to island from, from the grid um, and, and then you, you're able to use the power that's being produced by your solar panels. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice <laughs> seems to be failing me now. Um, but, basic, but basically that option is available. It is, it is more expensive and there aren't as many options available for that on the market. So that's often, you know, folks who are interested in that kind of backup power will look at batteries um, instead of just uh, a special inverter that allows you to island. And Corey, I can feel free. give, yeah. I can give uh, Zach a little break here for his voice uh, and uh, just add to that the, um, the, because the power from solar uh, arrays is variable based on the, the power of the sun at any given time, uh, you need, except in the case of uh, that he just described, which is called a secure power supply, uh, one particular inverter manufacturer uh, called SMA makes it, and they can do a small amount of load, but it's just for one, um, one outlet that's designated. If you want to run several circuits uh, on your home or even the entire home, what you need to do is, is add batteries so that the power can be smoothed out and matched to the loads in the house because you're using electricity, that usage goes up and down all the time and the solar usage goes up and down all the time. And in order for that to work, they actually have to be matched, which is what the grid does. Uh, so absent the grid, the batteries have to fill in in that situation. Um, your generator is doing that. And that's one of the reasons why when the power goes out, the generator cuts off the, the, the grid and then you run your house on the generator, but the solar needs the batteries to be able to do that same function. Um, so very long way of saying you can do it, but it, you're gonna need to add additional equipment. 
Thank you, Corey. <clears throat> I'll see if I can power through to the end here. Um, let's see, I see uh, one other question uh, asking if there is a solar United neighbors in Michigan. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have an on the ground program in Michigan, uh, but we do offer services and support nationally. So um, if you are interested in, in getting our help, uh, you know, comparing solar options in Michigan, uh, we do have a form on our website that, that you can fill out. Uh, and, and we'll have one of our solar professionals uh, get, get back to you soon, but that is just one-on-one -on -one support right now. Uh, I'm sure we would love to have a Michigan program, and, and I, I know there are, uh, there are definitely uh, great groups in Michigan doing uh, similar important work. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know enough to name drop any, so, uh, but uh, thank you for your interest. Um, and then I see another uh, question asking about help for low-income homes. Uh, so that is a fantastic question. Uh, so actually last year we had some uh, special grant funding that allowed us to do 10 uh, grant funded low income solar installations uh, around Indianapolis. Um, right now we don't have any additional funding to do that, but we are definitely exploring our options and are, are very interested in continuing uh, that work to make sure that the solar market is more inclusive uh, and, and that more folks can benefit no matter what their income is. Um, so thank you for that question. I hope that we will have more uh, answers uh, for questions like that soon. Uh, all right, so I'm not seeing any other questions. So, uh, but if you do have other questions, please feel free to, to share them in the chat. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and keep us uh, going here. So what's next? Uh, well, hopefully I've convinced you tonight to join one of our open co-ops. Uh, again, we have the Northwest Indiana Co-op uh, operating in and around Lake LaPorte and Porter counties. Excuse me. Um, and you can join that group by going to solarunitedneighbors.org slash NWI. Um, we also have the Indianapolis Co-op, uh, which is available uh, for folks in and around Indianapolis. And you can go uh, to solarunitedneighbors.org either slash Indianapolis or slash Indy 2021, which just happened to fit better on my slide. Uh, both link or uh, both URLs will get you to the same page. Um, at both pages, there, there's a bunch more information about the co-op including a recording of an earlier version of this presentation. Uh, but there's a bright orange button at the top that says join the co-op. Click that button, fill out the form. We'll do a remote roof assessment and we'll let you know whether or not we think your, uh, your roof is a good, a good fit for solar. Um, and then last uh, but not least, please, please do tell your friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, anybody else who you think might be interested in solar. We really rely on the support of uh, co-op members, other solar supporters in the area to help us connect with folks who might be interested and to really help the co-op grow. Our, you know, our, our goal here through the co-op is to help as many folks around the state as possible uh, put solar on their roofs. Um, and the, the last thing I will say, uh, which I, I mentioned throughout the presentation, that we are uh, working hard to build Indiana's solar movement, and that will really rely on uh, solar advocates like you. Um, so uh, we hope that you'll join the solar movement Again, you can go to solarunitedneighbors.org slash IN solar future and, and find a, uh, an easy form that will help you contact your, uh, your legislators in the Indiana General Assembly and tell them that you support pro solar policies uh, and net metering um, here in the state. Uh, but basically by, by uh, signing up to stay in touch with Solar United Neighbors, we'll let you know about all kinds of opportunities uh, that are available for you to take action. Um, and that is everything that I have. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I really appreciate you making the time. Um, I hope you'll join the co-op, but uh, if not, I hope you learned a little bit and I hope you uh, will continue to uh, advocate for solar in your community. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to stay on the line to, uh, to answer as much as I can. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and leave the chat open for a little bit. Uh, if anybody has any other questions. Uh, but if not, I want to say thank you, everybody. Have a good evening, and I'll see you all soon. All right. Not seeing any more, so I think we're going to go ahead and end the webinar. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I, I did. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm seeing a question. Uh, what did I say about a remote rooftop assessment? Um, so, so Laura, basically, when you sign up for the co-op, uh, we'll collect information about your, your address. It'll pull up a little Google map, and you can drop a pin on the map where you think the panels will, will fit. And then we have one of our, uh, our co-op specialists will 
we'll take a look at your at your roof or elsewhere on your property and make sure we think it's a good fit for solar. You know, if there's enough space, there won't be uh, shading or those other variables I talked about earlier. Um, and if, if we don't think it's a good fit, we'll let you know, if, hey, sorry, it doesn't look like your property is a good fit for solar. Uh, but if it is, um, then we'll let you know right away via email and, and then you'll be a co-op member. Uh, and I also see a question, how do we sign up uh, for the webinar on churches congregations? Uh, so uh, that webinar is actually not posted yet. It's going to be in uh, late April. Um, so uh, I think the best way to learn about that, we will definitely be promoting, uh, that won't be a Solar United Neighbors webinar, uh, but we will be promoting the webinar. So uh, you can join our Facebook group, uh, the Solar United Neighbors of Indiana Facebook group. Uh, we'll definitely have uh, posts about that webinar. Um, and if you're a co-op member or on our email list, uh, you'll probably hear about it as well. Uh, but so, so stay tuned. Uh, I was, we were just in early discussions, but I think it should be uh, uh, in, late, in late April um, where you can learn more about that webinar. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing another, another request to confirm if somebody's in the co-op. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the ability to pull that up right now. Um, but if, when in doubt, feel free to sign up again. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's totally free. There's no, and we can just merge your, your contacts in there. Um, but I can, uh, I can try to follow up afterwards. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have the ability to just kind of pull that up on, on, uh, the way my laptop is set up right now. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I think, I think that's everything. I'm glad I didn't shut things down, uh, too quick. Uh, but thank you once again for everybody who's stuck, uh, stuck it out through the end. Uh, really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.